just look to the Lord. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you that we can continue looking into your word. We pray that you would open it up to us. We pray that we may be helped and that we may be encouraged and that whether we are at the point of laying down responsibilities or at the point of picking up responsibilities, that you would guide us and that you would help us to work together in the interests of our Lord Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. So I would like to go on to another pair. We had Moses and Joshua. I would like to take up some things as to David and Solomon. Both are kings and you have a, uh, some, a different area of things uh, that God puts before us in connection with these two. Turn first of all to Second Chronicle, or First Chronicles, First Chronicles, chapter seventeen. David has a great project on his heart. In fact, one could read in the hundred thirty-second Psalm, and one would see that some somewhat of this project was on his heart when he was still a shepherd boy, uh, taking care of his father's sheep near Bethlehem. But in uh, chapter 17 of First Chronicles, it came to pass as David dwelt in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I dwell in a house of cedars and the ark of the covenant of Jehovah under curtains. And Nathan said to David, Do all that is in thy heart, for God is with thee. You know, oftentimes we're like this. A brother has something on his heart and uh, we know it's in the interests of the Lord and we slap him on the back, brother, God be with you, may, may the Lord help you, do all that's on your heart. And then it came to pass that night that the word of God came to Nathan saying, go and say to David, my servant, thus says Jehovah, thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in and uh, so on. I don't want to read all these verses, but uh, God says that he's going to appoint a place for his people Israel in verse 9. He would plant them, and he says he would subdue David's enemies. At the end of verse 10, I tell thee that Jehovah will build thee a house, and it shall come to pass when thy days are fulfilled that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. It is he who shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take away my mercy from him, as I took it from him that was before thee, and I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak to David. Now we know when we read these verses that God was looking beyond Solomon, because Solomon's throne was not established forever. Solomon died like all the rest of the kings have. And sad to say, Solomon was unfaithful at the end of his life. But God is looking on to the Lord Jesus here, and yet he says that he it is, one of your sons is going to build me a house. The project that you have on your heart, you are not going to accomplish, but I'm giving that project to one of your sons. Later on we find, I think it's in chapter 28, yes, uh, that God, that uh, when David tells Solomon this, he gives some details that we don't have here in chapter 17. Uh, we find in verse 5, uh, David is referring to all my sons. Well, I'll just read in the, uh, in the, from verse 4. 
Jehovah, the God of Israel, chose me out of all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever, for he has chosen Judah to be the prince, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he took pleasure in me to make me king over all Israel. And remember, David was the youngest of eight sons. And of all my sons, for Jehovah has given me many sons, he has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of Jehovah over me. And he said to me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be firm to do my commandments and mine ordinances as at this day. And so on. Solomon is before, before the people at this point. David has him standing before the people, and David mentions these things, and he goes on in verse 9, And thou, Solomon, my son, know the God of thy father. Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for Jehovah searches all hearts and discerns all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cut thee off forever. Consider now that Jehovah has chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. So this is a very special responsibility that God said Solomon would be taking rather than David. And how does David feel about it? Back in chapter 17, he speaks to the Lord in verse 16. King David went in and sat before Jehovah and said, Who am I, Jehovah Elohim, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? You know, if the Lord has given us a responsibility, if the Lord has entrusted something to us, it's the Lord's goodness to us. It's not because I am so special. You are so special. No, it's the Lord's goodness. Who am I, David says, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this has been a small thing in thy sight, O God. Thou hast spoken of thy servant's house for a great while to come and hast regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree. Jehovah Elohim, what can David say more to thee for the glory of thy servant? And indeed thou knowest, thou indeed knowest thy servant, Jehovah, for thy servant's sake, and according to thine own heart hast thou done all this greatness to make known all these great things. And, oh, David praises the Lord. And then he says in verse 23, And now, Jehovah, let the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house be established forever and do as thou hast said. Let it even be established and let thy name be magnified forever, saying, Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, is God to Israel and let the house of David thy servant be established before thee. And so on. He does not express any resentment that the Lord is not letting him do what had been on his heart for many years. There's no resentment there. The Lord has chosen Solomon to do this. And I think this is important when it comes to passing on responsibility, passing on leadership, whatever it might be, that it be done without resentment. Who are we? Why should we live as long as we do? Why should the Lord be pleased to entrust any responsibility to us? It's his grace. And for us to think, well, I have a place. I deserve this place. It's not a scriptural thought at all. Now, I'm reading quite a few verses because... These, some of these areas of scripture we don't read as often as we perhaps could. So that's why I'm reading without comment on some of these verses or with very little comment. Turn to Proverbs chapter 4. 
You know, Solomon is one of David's last sons to be born. And David, we can readily say, David messed up with his first sons. David was so busy fighting battles, winning wars, establishing his kingdom, and doing things that he did not put his family and their needs into the place where he should have put them. And furthermore, David had a number of wives. We may say, well, that was common with kings in those days. But in Deuteronomy 17, the Lord had warned against a king taking many wives. Solomon, of course, we know took a lot more. But David had quite a few wives and they had sons. And uh, we find that because of David's adultery and murder by proxy of uh, well, adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband through the Ammonites, when God faces him with this through the prophet, David says, you know, that the man is going to have to restore fourfold. We find in David's history that four of his sons die what we might term an untimely death. There's the baby that's born to Bathsheba to begin with. And there's Amnon who rapes his half-sister Tamar. There's Absalom who kills Amnon and then rebels against his father. And then when David is near the point of death, there's Adonijah who wants to take the throne for himself rather than having Solomon take it, as God had said. And he is killed shortly after the death of David. So David had to give up four sons, and these were, with the exception of the baby, these were older sons. But now in Proverbs 4, Solomon is writing. He says, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no intelligence. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was a son unto my father, tender and an only one in the sight of my mother. And he taught me and said unto, the, unto me, let thy heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get intelligence, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall keep thee. Love her, and she shall preserve thee. The beginning of wisdom is get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get intelligence. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to my head a garland of grace, a crown of glory will she bestow upon thee. Hear, my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be multiplied. I will teach thee in the way of wisdom. I will lead thee in paths of uprightness. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. When thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction, let her not go, keep her, for she is thy life, and so on. Some have taken some of these verses to refer to the Lord Jesus. Well, be that as it may, I'm not going to go into that. But in first line, Solomon is speaking about the instruction he got from his own father. David, when God made known to David that Solomon would do the work that David had wanted to do, build a temple for the Lord. David took care in bringing up Solomon. And you know, this is something that we don't know what our children are called to do. God, hasn't, God doesn't usually make known to a parent, I want your child to become a fireman or a policeman or you know, children sometimes want to be these things. But God does tell us to bring up our children for him. And the word of the princess of Egypt to Moses' mother, I think is relevant for all of us. Take this child and nurse him for me, and I will give thee 
their wages. So we have a responsibility with our children. Now we cannot, uh, a brother who is in a position of leadership cannot expect that his children will be in that same position. We find several times where something like that is done in scripture and where it is a failure. We find Eli did not correct his sons. Now his sons, of course, were priests because God had said the priests had to be of this family. But uh, Samuel evidently makes the same mistake because Samuel, godly man, judges Israel, he's a prophet. I mean, he's a great example for us. And yet when he got old, he made his two sons judges at the far end of the land. Probably was a bit much for him to get down there, so he make, puts his sons in charge. And uh, they do not do a good job. They are not honest and upright and God-fearing like Samuel was. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a dangerous thing for us to pick out, uh, you know, to favor our children for a responsibility that we have had. It may be that God calls our children to carry on in the responsibilities that we've had, but let it be God that chooses leadership among his people, not we. But what David did, I was a son unto my father, tender and an only one in the sight of my mother. Both parents cooperated in bringing up Solomon. And they were both concerned about him. We find in 1 Kings 1 how when Adonijah is about to take the throne, Bathsheba comes to David very disturbed. Didn't you promise this to Solomon? And so on. And uh, David had, and he lives up to his promise. But uh, we see here the importance that David put on wisdom for Solomon. If Solomon was going to serve the Lord, Solomon needed God-given wisdom. And he says, get wisdom, get understanding. And he emphasizes this. And we see in the life of Solomon, we don't have time to turn to all the scriptures on this, but in the life of Solomon, when God comes to him after he becomes king, and God says, ask me for whatever you want, what should I give you? And Solomon prays and says, please give me wisdom. I'm young. I'm a child. Actually, he was probably at least in his late teens. But before God, he says, I'm a child. And I would like wisdom from you to govern your great people. And, you know, it was a humble attitude and a right re request and God was pleased with Solomon asking for wisdom rather than for riches or power or long life or any of these things that man might ordinarily ask for. But we see Solomon had been taught by his father. And uh, one other scripture in connection with this teaching uh, in 1 Kings chapter 1, when David is about to die, or excuse me, chapter 2, 1 Kings chapter 2. When David is about to die, he calls Solomon in. There, there's unfinished business as far as ruling the kingdom that David had not been able to take care of. 1 Kings chapter 2, And the days of David were on, at hand that he should die, and he enjoined Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be of good courage, therefore, and be a man. It's good when fathers can encourage their sons, isn't it? I'm about to go the way of all the earth. I'm about to die. But you be of good courage and be a man and keep the charge of Jehovah thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his ordinances and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Notice how this gets repeated. We had it in connection with Moses and Joshua. Here it is with David and Solomon. The important thing is to do what God says in his word. 
walk according to the word. It's one of the last things that David says in a personal way to Solomon. And he says, uh, goes on to say that Jehovah may confirm his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, if thy sons take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man upon the throne of Israel. And then he reminds him of what Joab had done, how Joab had murdered two men whom David had chosen as captains. Well, the one was Abner, who was Saul's captain of the host, but Joab was afraid he was going to be replaced by, Ab uh, by Abner. And Amasa, David had chosen him in place of Joab, and uh, Joab killed both of these. And he shed the blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and upon his sandals that were according that were on his feet. And thou shalt do according to thy wisdom and not let his hoar head go down to Sheol in peace. <coughs> but show kindness to the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite and let them be of those that eat at thy table. For so they came up to me when I fled because of Absalom thy brother. Behold, there's with the Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite of Beharim, who cursed me with a grievous curse in the day that I went down to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by Jehovah, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword, and now hold him not guiltless. For thou art a wise man, and thou shalt know what thou oughtest to do to him. But bring his whore head down to Sheol with blood. Notice David says to Solomon, Thou art a wise man. And yet, this one to whom David says, Thou art a wise man, a little bit later, asks the Lord for wisdom, realizes that he needs wisdom from above. And regardless of how capable our father may think of us, our mother may think of us, and no matter how capable others may think we are, we need that wisdom that comes from the Lord. And we need to ask him for wisdom. And David had taught Solomon to seek wisdom. But here we find in these, in these verses, David commends Solomon, confesses, I have failed in certain things. I have not done all that I should have done. You know, we have to be honest one with another. We should not take the attitude Look at me, I'm perfect. I've always done right. No. We need our help from the Lord. Well, this is at the end of the life. Now turn back to First Chronicles, this time to chapter 22, or the end of chapter 21, actually. Remember, David failed in numbering the people. God had given him a very numerous people and had given him many victories. And then David wants to know how many soldiers he can count upon, how many men he has in his army. And uh, God sends the destroying angel and some 70,000 are killed within a matter of just a few days. And we read at the end of chapter uh, 21, uh, but David could not go in before it, before the altar of burnt offering and the ark. David could not go in before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid because of the sword of the angel of Jehovah. And David said, this is the house of Jehovah, and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. The place where the angel had drawn his sword when David offered sacrifice, which he had gotten from the Jebusite, this was the place where the temple was to be built. And then we read that, verse 2, David commanded to collect the strangers that were in the land of Israel. And he set masons to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors of the gates, and for the joists, and brass in abundance without weight, and cedar trees innumerable, 
for the Zidonians and they of Tyre brought cedar wood in abundance to David. For David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be built for Jehovah must be exceeding great in fame and in beauty in all lands. I will therefore make preparation for it. And David prepared abundantly before his death. So David can't build the temple, but he makes preparations. He gets the materials together. He gets the, uh, those who were left of the Canaanites to do the hard work of quarrying the stones and cutting the trees and bringing the timber to Jerusalem. We want to remember that Jerusalem is uh, built at an elevation. It's built on a hilltop, really, an elevation of about 2,600 feet, you know, half a mile above sea level. And no matter which direction you come to Jerusalem from, you're going up. The Psalms mention that too. I rejoiced when they said unto me, let us go up unto the house of Jehovah. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. It's 122nd Psalm. So David prepares an abundance here. And then in verse 6, he, said, he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for Jehovah the God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, As for me, my son, I was minded to build a house unto the name of Jehovah my God. But the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, for thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to thee who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon. God told David this in chapter 17, before Solomon was born. His name shall be Solomon. And in his days I will give peace and quietness unto Israel. He shall build a house unto my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now my son Jehovah be with thee, that thou mayest prosper, and build the house of Jehovah thy God, as he has said of thee. Only Jehovah give thee wisdom and understanding, and place thee over Israel, and to keep the law of Jehovah thy God. Then shalt thou prosper, if thou takest heed to perform the statutes and ordinances which Jehovah commanded Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous, fear not, neither be dismayed. And behold, in my affliction I have prepared for the house of Jehovah a hundred thousand talents of gold. Ordinarily, it's figured that a talent was 75 pounds by weight. This would be seven and a half million pounds of gold. Tremendous amount. I have prepared in abundance. Uh, well, 100,000 talents of gold and 1,000 thousand talents of silver. 75 million pounds of silver. And of brass and iron without weight, and you know, beyond measurement, for it is in abundance. And timber and stone have I prepared, and thou shalt add to it. Notice how David is giving Solomon instruction as Solomon grows up. Solomon, this is what the Lord has chosen you for. This is what he wants you to do. And I've done all that I can in my limited way. I've done a lot, but God had said you're not to build the temple. David had all these provisions to build with, and he says, Solomon, I've done all that I can to help you when the Lord gives you the time and the signal to build. And he goes on from there, verse 15, and there are workmen with thee in abundance. Hewers and workers of stone and timber, and all manner of skillful men for every kind of work. Of the gold, the silver, and the brass, and the iron, there's no number. 
Arise and be doing, and Jehovah be with thee. Solomon, what you're going to do, you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. There are others, skilled people, lots of others who can help you. But you have the responsibility to take direction here and uh, to appreciate those that can help. And then we read that David commanded all the princes of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, Is not Jehovah your God with you? And has he not given you rest on every side? For he's given the inhabitants of the land into my hand, and the land is subdued before Jehovah and before his people. Now set your heart and your soul to seek Jehovah your God, and arise and build the sanctuary of Jehovah Elohim, to bring the ark of the covenant of Jehovah and the vessels of the sanctuary of God into the house that is to be built unto the name of Jehovah. And then we read, And David was old and full of days, and he made Solomon his son king over Israel. That one verse, 1 Kings 1, in I think over 50 verses, gives us the details of how David made his son Solomon king. Here in Chronicles, it's simply summed up. And incidentally, the books of Samuel and the books of Kings are basically looking at the history of Israel from the standpoint of how men tend to look at things. When the kingdom is divided, the books of Kings concentrate on the northern kingdom primarily until the northern kingdom is no more. And uh, in, the, in those books, we find that pr uh, prophets are very prominent. God sends prophets uh, to exhort, to straighten out his people again and again. The books of Chronicles are written later on. They have the place in the Old Testament that Deuteronomy has in the Pentateuch. And uh, the, in Chronicles, you have particular emphasis placed on that which God was very interested in, that which was precious to God. You have a number of chapters of how David organizes the priests and the Levites and everyone who's the singers and so on to take part in the temple worship, how he concentrates on getting ready for the temple to be built and so on. Not much is said about the northern kingdom in Chronicles in comparison to the southern kingdom where there was a measure of God, uh, the fear of God yet and uh, kings that, uh, that pleased God. So these are, you know, two different viewpoints, much of the same history, but uh, Chronicles, for example, does not give the story of David's adultery with Bathsheba and uh, the results of that. Kings gives that. And uh, one reads the two books together to get the whole story, as much as God reveals to us at least. But uh, it's good to keep in mind that uh, we have two different viewpoints uh, in these books, different emphases. Now, David has uh, organized things. David is a great organizer. Turn back to chapter 28 again. 1 Chronicles 28. There we find, we come to the end of David's life now. David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, the princes of the divisions, and so on. The various officials are mentioned. He assembles them unto Jerusalem at the end of the verse. And King David stood up upon his feet now in 1 Kings 1, you find that toward the end of David's life, he had to lie in bed most of the time. They had to get somebody to keep him warm and so on. Here we find David, King David stood up upon his feet and said, hear me, my brethren and my people. I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah and for the footstool of our God. And I have prepared to build but God said to me, Thou shalt not build a house. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, for thou art a man of war. 
and has shed blood. And the Lord reviews, uh, David reviews what the Lord has said. We read some of this before. And uh, he reviews this before all the officials of Israel. Solomon is there with him. And he says in verse 9, what we read there, Thou Solomon, that my son, know the God of thy father. Serve him with a perfect heart, with a willing mind. This is David's last public appearance before the leaders of his people. And uh, he admonishes Solomon to seek the Lord. And uh, then we read in verse 11 that David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of its houses, of its treasuries. And so on verse after verse here, how God had given David directions how the temple was to be built. And uh, we read even that in verse 19, all this said David in writing by Jehovah's hand upon me, instructing as to all the works of the pattern. So David, he can give Solomon what we would call the blueprint, the whole pattern for everything in connection with the temple in writing, gives it to him. And this is how God has instructed that he wants the house built. And David said to Solomon, verse 20, his son, be strong and courageous and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for Jehovah Elohim, my God, will be with thee, and he will not leave thee, neither forsake thee, until all the work of the service of the house of Jehovah is finished. And behold, the courses of the priests and Levites are for all the service of the house of God. Thou hast with thee for all manner of workmanship, every willing man, skillful for every sort of service, and the princes and all the people are holy at thy commandment. All this is public, publicly said by a king who's ready to pass on to be with the Lord. And King David said to all the congregation, Solomon, my son, the one whom God has chosen, is young and tender, and the work is great, for this palace is not to be for man, but for Jehovah Elohim. And I prepared according to all my power for the house of my God, gold for things of gold, silver for things of silver, brass for things of brass, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistering stones, and of diverse colors, and all manners of precious stones, and white marble in abundance, and moreover in my affection for the house of my God, I have given of my own property, of gold and silver, for the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the house of the sanctuary, three thousand talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the wall of, walls of the houses, gold for things of gold, silver for things of silver, and for all manner of work by the hands of artificers. And who is willing to offer to Jehovah this day? Now, David was not trying to extract something from the people. He was not sending out letters like so many Christians in many, many groups do today. Uh, there's this particular need. Would you contribute? Would you pledge? Would you so on? David says, I've done, I've prepared for the Lord. I've even given of my own personal substance on top of that. Would anyone else like to have part in that? And the chief fathers and princes and so on offered willingly, it says. And they gave for the service of the house of God and their gifts are mentioned uh, in these next verses. Verse 9, And the people rejoiced because they offered willingly, for with perfect heart they offered willingly to Jehovah. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. And David blessed Jehovah in the sight of all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Jehovah, the God of our father Israel, forever and ever thine Jehovah is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and on the earth is thine. Thine, Jehovah, is the kingdom and thou art exalted 
as head above all, and riches and glory are of thee, and thou rulest over everything, and in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make all great and strong. And now, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer willingly after this manner? For all is of thee, and that which is from thy hand have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners as all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is no hope of life. Jehovah our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee a house to thy holy name is of thy hand and is all thine own. And I know, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart have I willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, offer willingly to thee, Jehovah God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and direct their hearts to thee, and give to Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, and to do all, and to build the palace for which I have made provision. And David said to all the congregation, Bless now Jehovah your God. And all the congregation, Bless Jehovah the God of their fathers, and bowed down their heads and did homage to Jehovah and the king. And then they sacrificed. And in verse 22, they ate and drank before Jehovah on that day with great joy. And they made Solomon the son of David king the second time and anointed him to Jehovah to be prince and Zadok to be priest. And then Solomon sits on the throne. David had, had to have him crowned and anointed uh, very quickly in 1 Kings 1 because Adonijah was trying to get ahead of it. But here it's open and public before all the people. The leadership is passed on. And in verse 26, now David, the son of Jesse, reigned over all Israel. In the time that he reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron, and he reigned 33 years in Jerusalem, and he died in a good old age full of days, riches, and honor. And Solomon, his son, reigned in his stead. So we see this is a, a different way of doing things than what we had with Moses and Joshua. But God had chosen Solomon well in advance, had chosen Solomon before he was born. And I think one lesson for us, we need to remind our children and our young people as they grow up, what God's calling is for them. Now, we cannot tell them, you are called to be a missionary to Congo. We don't know that. But there are many things that God tells us that he expects of all of us, and particularly, too, that he expects us as parents to teach our children. And it's a real joy when we see them following in some measure. Just to add something very personal. When we were first married, before we were married a year, the Lord entrusted three foster children to us to take care of for the next, well, it was about two and a half years, something like that, off and on during that time. And. Uh, had the joy of baptizing two of them. And uh, they had been in classes and came to Sunday school meetings with us and so on. They're grown up a long time ago. We, we've been married a little over 50 years now. As we've, uh, on this trip, Madeline and I visited one of the girls. She has a grandmother now. She's in her early 60s and hadn't seen her for a number of years. But what a joy to see her and her husband walking with the Lord 
They each teach Sunday school in a Baptist church. Yes, I'm thankful for it. They've had their problems with their children to some degree. They have a grandson that they're bringing up now. And so, but you know, when, after all these years to see our foster kids going on with the Lord and the joy that we have with our own children to see them walking with the Lord and grandchildren. The Apostle John writes in his second epistle, and that's the last verse I'll read before we close here. In Second John, he says in verse 4, I rejoiced greatly that I have found of thy children. You can't say all thy children necessarily. But I have found of thy children walking in truth as we have received commandment from the Father. And in 3 John he says in verse 3, For I rejoiced exceedingly when the brethren came and bore testimony to thy holding fast the truth, even as thou walkest in truth. I have no greater joy than these things that I hear of my children walking in the truth. May God bless his word to our hearts. Perhaps a brother would close in prayer for now.